gaining at an intro. This is a super intro. I mean, you could potentially take an epistemology class within your first year of college. So you could graduate high school 18, so you could be like 18, 19 years old sitting in a class like this. It's not about to complicate it and make it super difficult. The idea is just to get you to think. And the, and, and the idea, specifically speaking at this point, is more of a question for you, right? As a viewer, hopefully being introduced to this for the first time, I know many of you already know all this and probably are bored, but I'm not doing it for you. Um, the idea is, if you're introduced to this idea for the first time, that becomes a difficult question, right? How do I make sense of my knowledge? Because my knowledge changes all the time. Um, the things that I thought I believe collapse into things that I no longer believe. How do I get rid of them? You know, where are they? In, in a sense, it's not like the draw. You can't just take it out. It's always there. My belief that, which I now believe to be false, but my belief and the relationship between my not wearing shoes and catching a cold, well, it, it exists. It's still there in my head, right? <laughs> we'll talk about what that means later, right? I now know that it's false, but I can also say that that belief was one at the same time. It was true, and then it was false. And there was a time I believed it to be true. There was a time to believe it was false. How? What does the organization of that knowledge? Um, what does it do? And the question is: This is this is why I don't like philosophy, right? Philosophy is a waste of time. This is what they're talking about. Um, this is precisely what we're talking about, and it is so not a waste of time. Why? Because if you have any desire to build robots that can think, <laughs> if artificial intelligence is to really get off the ground, then we have to understand how we think. So it's these really mundane questions that need to be understood in the most profound complexity. Right? How do we organize and transform uh, the contents of our um, the contents of our thinking? Uh, one last um, point is, this is the bit that I liked about Astro Boom Boy's response to my, he, Astro Boom Boy ended up winning the iPad 2 at the last giveaway that I had, and his understanding and his assessment of what it is that philosophy does is precisely this, right? Philosophy is, in a sense, a discipline, quote unquote, it's more of a tool used to think about the way we think, right? It's, it's a tool to talk about the way in which our thinking is organized, right? We're not talking necessarily about content relationship at this point, though there was some reference to content relationship here. We're talking about the organization of the content information that we have. Okay. Number eight. Um, let's see where I'm at. Number eight. Um, it probably. Oh, sorry about that. So it probably makes no sense, strictly speaking, to talk about the number of things one believes. We we recognize just on one example that we can take one belief and regress it to infinity. And so far as we regress it to infinity, that seems like a sort of a, a ridiculous sort of means of assessment. So let's move away from that discourse. So 8A, eight, eight, the attempt to systematically review, the attempt to systematically review our beliefs cannot be undertaken on the level of individual beliefs. And the reason is why? So this is a very good question, right? Sort of epistemology 101. You can test someone, they, they say they know epistemology, you ask them this really basic question. If they don't really understand the nature of the question and they can't answer the question, you can help help them. And this is what's cool about education, right? Is that you can help them come to understand epistemology at a more fuller, richer level. Because I think even people who do really understand epistemology, if confronted with a very basic question, have unfortunately the tendency to answer in this very convoluted response. And it really is to mask the fact that they don't know. The question is simply this, right? Um, the attempt to systematically review, why is it the case that the attempt to review the contents of our beliefs can't be undertaken? Why can't you do it by looking at individual beliefs? Why can't you assess the totality based on individual beliefs? A very simple response is that the analysis and assessment of one belief can have a regression to infinity by a compounded sort of meta belief my belief of my belief of my belief of my belief and my belief right so that um, a meta level analysis of an individual belief lends itself to an infinite regress right a meta level analysis of an individual belief lends itself to an infinite regress uh, what I then am talking about becomes overwhelming and it just sort of cripples the process 
in itself. That's precisely why you can't do that, arguably. All right, AP. The malleability of our beliefs makes the systemic <coughs> or systematic attempts to transform our knowledge, the ability to transform something that we did know into something that we don't know or something that we don't know into something that we do know, by means of individual belief assessment impossible. Right? The malleability of our beliefs makes the systematic attempt to transform our knowledge by means of individual belief assessment impossible. Why? The example that I gave before, I believed at one time in my life when I was much younger that walking in the rain causes you to get a cold. I recognize that walking in the rain does not cause you to get a cold. The fact that I had a belief and the fact that, that my understanding of the truth, we'll talk about truth functionality later, but the truth functionality of that particular proposition has transformed, transforms the nature of my knowledge. But think about all of the things that changes on a daily basis. And if you're really a philosopher like me, I mean, you have really no grounding. <laughs> the skeptic is, a very, to be a skeptic, uh, properly speaking, this is why I love Nietzsche so much, right? To be a, a skeptic, properly speaking, right, the, if you look back to the sort of Hellenic skeptics, right, and, and, the, and the ideologies that they espoused, it's a very difficult thing because the content of your knowledge is perpetually in swing. It's perpetually changing. There is, right, and I, I get religious faith and I get spirituality and I get people who are sort of dogmatically attached to their political affiliation and such, partisanship. I get all of that. Why do I get that? Why does it make sense? Because there's comfort in knowing that there's some fixed position in the to total sum of my content knowledge. There's a position in my content knowledge that is just fixed and I and it remains fixed dogmatically. So that I can say no, that this proportion, quote unquote, of the things that I know is fixed, it's not open to debate. Being a philosopher, I cannot accept that position. I can't be a partisan, right? You know, if there's someone on the right who's conservative and he's got a really good stance or she's got a really good stance and I think that they have a better stance than, than a, a liberal position, I'm gonna vote for the conservative, right? Because I, I'm not wedded to anything except Right? Accept the ability to recognize that the total sum, this is a little bit more advanced now, but the total sum of my, my content knowledge is itself, meaning everything within it, is itself always open to transformation. Right? So it doesn't make sense to look at individual beliefs and the contents of knowledge in terms of individual beliefs because as I said before, you have to watch the video to make sense of this, because we recognize that non-monotonic logic transforms precisely the content of your belief. And since the content of our belief is large and possibly infinite, if you look at sort of a meta-analysis of belief, we recognize then that meta-analysis compounded with non-monotonic logical analysis means that you have an infinite transformation. And that's just not, that's not feasible. It doesn't make sense, right? We got super deep at the end just there, but hopefully that made sense, right? I, I didn't mean to get to that point that quickly, but I mean, you should, you should, that should have made sense, I hope, hopefully. All right, so 8C then, the redundancy of our beliefs also makes it impossible. And I just explained that. So my belief in X and my response to the question asking about my belief in X, does this constitute two beliefs or one belief in Y? And this is what I'm talking about, right? Someone, someone's belief that they saw a movie, and then someone's challenge about their belief that they saw a movie. Does it occupy one position or two positions? And even the, t the word occupation, the word positionality, all of these are misnomers because we're talking about our mind. Um, technically speaking, I believe that we're talking about sort of biological secretions. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but the idea is, loosely speaking, so that you have a visual at this sort of introductory level, what does it mean to talk about the content of our knowledge if this is the case? So I don't want to overkill it because it's, it should be clear now. So the point is, we cannot have, top of page five, we cannot have holistic transformation of our knowledge by assessing individual beliefs. You cannot have holistic transformation by assessing, and now we've arrived at a definitive claim, right? We cannot arrive at holistic understanding or assessment of the content of our knowledge because we recognize meta-analysis of belief 
lends itself towards infinite regress, compounded with 